Hey guys. Hey man. Yeah, worship was a fun time. I really believe that's a gift, right? I mean, you think about the songs that are being written nowadays and how intimate they are. And some of them, if you've noticed when we sing them, it's sometimes it's like a prayer. Sometimes it's just declaring the awesomeness of who he is. But, but man, whenever you have a chance to be in a corporate setting like this, Get real personal with the Lord. Don't just get in a sing-along. Like this isn't the little prep for the speaker, right? The worship service. Most of us know this, but it's so easy to get lulled to sleep and just kind of go through the motion of a thing. But man, we're, we got words of truth up there. Yeah. That reckless love song. I mean, that's amazing. So when you're listening to those words and you're looking, take that personal. Wow, you really gave your son to redeem my life, restore my life. Man, when I didn't even understand, you knew from the beginning and you didn't change. And you and you could just let things get personal and that's how they start coming alive. Amen? Or, or, we just have a God who really somehow wants to be our friend and pay a price to make sure we're in heaven forever and we live kind of puzzled by that, but say we believe in that and things don't really change in our lives. <laughs> I'm done with that like 23 years ago. Because <laughs> I went to church till I was about 20, and he died on the cross to forgive me of my sins. And one day this trumpet was going to blow, and he was going to come. And I was going to go to heaven when he came, so I had to make sure I prayed that prayer. And I got baptized when I was 12, and one day he was going to come. My life didn't change because of that. My, my, my mind said, well, why does he care so much? Well, why would he do something like that for me? I didn't have a good view of me. Who had a good view of you growing up? A lot of us, we're just aware of what's wrong with us, what needs to change, and our secrets aren't our secrets to our own conscience. <laughs> and then internally, you value yourself based on the life you've lived instead of the life you're created for. And all of a sudden, this gospel creates more questions in your heart than understanding. So all of a sudden, I'm supposed to stay in church because he's coming someday. And if he comes, be sure be good if I was in church. <laughs> I'm just saying. It's how I believed the gospel growing up. That's all anybody ever told me. He died on the cross because I was a sinner. And I had to accept the forgiveness of sins through the shedding of his blood. My name goes in a book called Life. And when he comes, bam, I'm in. I'm on the right side of the fence. That was the gospel. That's how the gospel was preached to me my whole life. Nobody ever taught me he wanted to redeem something like my created value, my purpose. Nobody ever really taught me that he wanted to come inside of me and live and bring all that he is inside of me. His ways, his motives, his goodness, his love. Nobody ever really talked to me about transformation and becoming a brand new person. Die into the old man and his deeds and live in to everything he created me to be. And I'm not talking about works and trying harder and biting your lip to not mess up. I'm talking about believing a truth about yourself through what he accomplished and letting faith bring a grace into your life that empowers you to be what you couldn't be in your own strength. He's really, really good. And I'm going to talk about it just a little bit, all right? Yeah. You guys okay? Okay, I'm glad I'm here. Yeah, I'm glad I'm here. I, do you still do the, 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 the mascot guys still come out on Sunday mornings? It depends on the service. They're downstairs the whole time. That's really the reason I came back. <laughs> For the children's church. Does he still come out? You can come out as him. No, but somebody will, right? I'll be so let down. No. <laughs> I mean, I'd like to tell you that I'm here because you're here tonight, but I'm here to see that guy on Sunday <laughs> It just blessed my socks off. I remember that. <laughs> so, all fun and aside, but that was actually an amazing time. What changed in my life a long time ago, 23 years in June, was that one minute I didn't know God. I, I could have talked about him. I could have preached a sermon. Probably I, I grew up in church. I was asked to lead a youth group when I was 18. I did that for a while. I preached a couple sermons and felt important. <laughs> Teaching in my youth group, I felt important. But I didn't pray. I didn't know God. It's just, honestly, 
I'm sorry, anybody can preach a sermon. I got so much stuff out there available now. You just cross reference and you follow the little A's and the ones and the B's and the and you connect the dots, and next thing you know, you could present a theologically, doctrinally connective sermon. But that that's really very little to do with Christianity or why he came preaching a sermon. It's the word becoming flesh. It's God restoring you back to what he intended in the first place. It's you and I realizing that we were trained by a lie our whole life and we grew up with an emotional makeup that was perverted from the time man sinned and got separated from God. That all of us in this room were born into Adam and grew up not knowing God personally. So your attitudes, your mindset, your desire, your opinions... They all were birthed and formed out of separation from God. It's human wisdom. It's the way that seems right. It's full of attitude. It's full of opinion. Full of expression, haughtiness, pride. Nobody, nobody had to practice to be that way. <laughs> That's the giveaway. None of us had to try to be angry. It came naturally. None of us had to try to be frustrated. <laughs> Nobody taught you to be insecure one day when you had an awareness of yourself at a very young age. All of a sudden, the, people laughed at something you wore and you didn't even notice. A child laughed at your lunchbox when you were little and you didn't even know they were laughing at you, but there came a time where you knew they were laughing at you. And your innocence was slipping away and you were becoming more self-conscious, more aware of yourself, and more aware of how people saw you. That's a tough day for everybody. Because people aren't seeing you in love. They aren't seeing you through his eyes. It's survival at its best. And, and, and everybody in this room, at a very young age was being molded and shaped into something that you're not apart from your circumstances, something you're not apart from how it all went down because you inadvertently just reacted to how it all unfolded in your life. And honestly, that's where you found your identity, your value. That's where you thought you found you. And at a very young age, you were nothing more than how you responded to how it unfolded. They laugh at you when you're in second grade and, and you're aware it's you they're laughing at and, and, you're, and you're faced with feelings, emotions, insecurities, uncertainties. You, you become either introverted or you toughen up and become a fighter. But right there is where you start being molded and shaped at a very young age and it has nothing to do with God. It has nothing to do with the great potter. And it's in that moment you begin to start finding an identity. And believe this is who I am. It's a, it's a sad thing in the church when we don't preach this thing clear enough that people, when they get saved, they, they found a pathway to heaven. They found Jesus the way. Hey, I hope I'm forgiven of everything, but I'll believe it for now and, and just thank God for his blood. But then they keep that same identity. They keep that same insecurity. People that are Christians hold on to their past. They hold on to the story of how it was growing up. Who did what to me? You don't know what it was like when I was 6, 8, 10, 12. There's a reason that people hold their story so tight. It's because it's the only place they find identity. Whether it's good or bad, they found something called them in the story. And they're actually believing that's them. That's why it's so hard to get people to not look back because it's the only place they really know them. They kind of found themselves in that unfolding called life. But the truth about the gospel is you find yourself in Christ. When he's revealed, when you understand the why behind his heart and his motive, that he didn't just come because you're a sinner. He came to fulfill what man failed. He came to model a life you were created for. He didn't, he didn't come just so you sing to him in a corporate setting or pray to him when you're overwhelmed. He came so you follow him. He didn't come to take you to heaven. 
He came to put heaven inside you. He came to put his life and his nature inside you. In the Old Testament, his ways are higher than our ways. But through the blood in the New Testament, Christ in us, the hope of glory, we become one. I no longer call you a servant. You're a friend. Why? Because a servant doesn't know what his master's doing. That means his ways are our ways now. He changes things. He says, all authority in heaven and earth has been given under me. Now go in my name. It says he's been given in Philippians 2, the name above every name which every knee and tongue, heaven, earth, under the earth is going to bow and confess that he's Lord. Right after it says that, the very next word say, you therefore. <laughs> Connecting us. Making us one. We did not grow up with the attitude of heaven. We did not grow up and look anything like Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> it's a sad day when we can just think that the things we do, Christian, is what makes us Christian. Instead of Christ-likeness and the Christ in us and his heart and his love overtaking us and his motives in our life. This is what nobody ever talked to me about growing up. That's why I talk about it all the time. No preacher ever told me. I'm not mad at preachers. I don't think anybody understood when I was in my circle growing up. Nobody ever told me that he died on the cross to redeem my value. To put his spirit in me and his life in me so that who I was could die and who he is in me could live. That I could actually get renewed in the spirit of my mind and actually be transformed and get up in the morning for a whole different reason of being. And not even be self-conscious anymore and not need you to like me or even try. But just to wake up to pursue being like him. Just to wake up to live by the Spirit. Just to wake up to walk in love. To wake up and show mercy to you because he showed mercy to me. To wake up and not have an attitude towards you that doesn't produce life because he never had one like that towards me. To not be judgmental and first impression and he said, she said, well, I think and whatever. Look, I'm done with that. I've been done with that for a long time. And I'm telling you, you can be done with that too. Don't sell cheap when you've been bought with a price. And don't think the way you were trained to think yesterday has anything to do with the way you're created to think. Don't let the wisdom of the world eat your lunch and swallow you up. Don't let the way that seems right trump the truth in your life. See, that's what's so difficult because it seems right. But if you look at the basic thing that hinges on, that way that seems right hinges on, it's all your own well-being, fairness, who did right, who did wrong, victim, villain. The way that seems right to a man has a whole different foundation than love. The way that seems right to man it's more like a talk show. Who did what? Who did wrong? Who started it? Can't believe they did that to you. Wow, and you were so, and they turned around anyway and betrayed your heart. Wow, it must be hard for you to trust anymore anyway. <laughs> and the whole audience, victim, villain, rah, eh, oh. In that scene, everybody's losing. Because everybody's hearts are a million miles away from him. Amen. And it's just about what one person did and how one person responded instead of Jesus and what he accomplished and how do we come out looking like him. I'm going to talk straight. I'm not mad at anybody. I'm not even talking to you personally. I promise you Jesus did not give his life to put his spirit inside of us so we can think from the same place we thought before we knew him. He said, do not be conformed to the world. And you study that out. It means it's ideas, it's logic, it's wisdom, it's philosophy, it's motives. It doesn't just mean murder, rape, and adultery. It just means thinking for yourself. 
Man, you just get a little thinking for yourself in your life and see where that takes you. We all know. Next thing you know, you're angry, frustrated, judgmental, feel sorry for yourself. Nobody cares. Nobody likes me. Next thing you know, you're insecure. Now you're doing things to get attention instead of because you care or love. And all of a sudden, it's just all about you trying to be somebody and you find yourself through him. You come to a church, you get involved, but you're running a risk if your motive's not pure because maybe even there they didn't seem to appreciate you or give you what you need and now I laid down my life, I gave extra time, I served double and nobody's even said thank you. Now we got another hurt person in church coming and singing hallelujah. Come on, I'm just talking. I've been a pastor for a while. I see this stuff. It startles me. We've got to scream it out from the rooftops. Hey! Come on. What's the why behind your life? Why did you wake up this morning? Come on. What motivated your heart? You're just trying to get by? You're just hoping she likes you? You're just hoping he digs you? Are you just making your own way? It's not harsh. Sober. Mercy wakes us up every day. If you're awake, it's because mercy said so. Yay. Why does mercy wake us up every day? To just give us another day to shine. Another day to be like him. Another day to follow him. Because then if she likes you or he digs you, has a whole different look and a whole different outcome and a whole different purpose. Hey, I live for myself. I feel like I was the most selfish man on the planet. That's how I see myself when I wasn't saved. I'm sure other people were like me, but it's, it's sobering when I look at how I was. I don't do it in any condemnation. It's sobering. I go, because I know how I lived. I felt like my family owed me. I felt like they owed me just because I went to work and made money to pay bills. I felt like they had to do everything the way that pleased me. They were my subjects, not my family. I know how I was before I was saved. It frightens me to think that I was living that way and had the capacity to function that way for 33 years and still say, I love you. And then Jesus comes and reveals himself to me. And in my mind, I'm the most selfish man that ever lived on the planet. And what I saw in my heart was so wretched, I couldn't live that way another day because it's absolutely a zero. I actually had a revelation that my life and my motives were taking me to a big fat zero. And then when I read the Bible and it says, unless a seed dies and falls to the ground, it abides alone. Now I get it. Because if I just live every day pursuing me, my well-being, my welfare, even my blessing, my provision. You can spiritualize it all you want. If you're a Christian for you and your own gain, that's not why we're Christians. You're gonna, you're, it's a big mistake. You're going to have a terrible time. <laughs> and that's not negative speech. I'm not prophesying doom. If you're a Christian for you... You're in trouble. It's unscriptural. The Bible says if you follow me, you better deny yourself. You don't be a Christian for your gain, your sake, your marriage to be restored, or you to get the job you went to school for. <laughs> you become a Christian to become the person that he created you for from the beginning, that he intended man to be from day one. And you give up the old so you can become the nail. And you die to the old man and his deeds so you can live to the new man. Who's he, Colossians 3.10? He's renewed in knowledge according to the image of the one who created him. So you see what the gospel is? A restoration back to the image of God in man. It's back to the way it was in the first place. <laughs> I look over the last few generations and what it slowly gravitated into in this self-centered thing. Man, we got people mad at God, discouraged. There's discouraged people that go to church. 
We can't hardly talk about it because it's expected. Well, of course there's discouragement. This discouragement's a giveaway. Your eyes are on you. You say, you don't know what I'm going through right there. That's what I'm talking about. <laughs> no, thanks for helping me. That's the giveaway. Because what he went through is supposed to trump that. Because you die to yourself and give your life back to him. And then he lives in you and lives his life through you. So if he wasn't discouraged when they called him a liar, you probably shouldn't be discouraged because they blamed you for something at work you didn't do. So if he didn't get mad and speak deceit out of his mouth, we probably should be careful in that moment. Because <laughs> if death and life is in your tongue, it's probably important what comes out. Because we just blame everything on the will of God. We just blame everything on the sovereignty of God. And then men believe that everything that happens is God. Instead of taking the privilege they've been given to walk in the Spirit and live by the Spirit and speak life and sow kingdom seeds and reap kingdom things. To love and make peace and show mercy and see men for their value, not their faults be able to weep for people instead of weep because of people. Boy, that's a good transition. You know where I got all this stuff? From Jesus. <laughs> I'm reading my Bible one day and I realized on the night he was betrayed, he laid down his life and gave his blood in his body. On the night he was betrayed. And I thought on the night we're betrayed, we call a friend and cry. <laughs> Tell them all about the betrayal and then say, pray for me. And then your friend spiritualizes the conversation and prays some blessing over your emotions so you feel better. <laughs> and we call that Christianity. Oh. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> I mean, if that's where we're living from, we're just one moment away from falling out and falling apart. We're just a people button away from shipwrecking. We're just one injustice away. And then two injustices. Oh, God forbid. <sighs> On the night he was betrayed, he gave his life. Not being mean. Follow me tonight. If we're Christians, we understand because we already gave ours. So I'm just talking to Christians. If you're not a Christian, why not? It's the most humble, beautiful, amazing thing that all God would ask you to do is give back what you never were created for. Give back what you are not. Right, right. He's just asking for your life. People, Christians say, pastors say, this gospel will cost you everything. It just costs you what you never were. Right. Give back the lie so you can have the truth. Yes. And that truth's going to make you free. And he that the Son sets free, he's going to stay free because he sees. So his life's not his own. So he lays down his life. Come on, it's just good and sober. It's good to hear it out of about 10 different people. Because it gets in, it's just out of the mouths of two or more. Yeah? Because sometimes it's just easy to get up in the morning if you don't stay sharp in these truths and commune them back this way to God. And we'll talk about that a lot this weekend. We got a lot of time tomorrow. If you come, I'll come. I'm going to come. I'm here. I'm going to be here tomorrow. If you're not, that's fine. You're here tonight. I got your faces tonight. I'm just going to let it rip. But tomorrow we'll explain more and teach more. He gave me a lot of time. So I can really just pour out my heart. But how easy it is it to just wake up and not take heed of the things you've heard. Bible says, take heed of the things you've heard. It's in Hebrews 2. It's right there. It takes earnest heed, earnest heed. That's even more than taking heed. Take earnest heed of the things you've heard, lest they slip away. And all of a sudden, you're just getting a little hurt, a little touchy, a little offended. 
All of a sudden, you're just a little let down because your spouse said that and you can't believe it. Now you're meditating, musing on the fact that they said that and where'd that come from and how they have the capacity instead of just covering them and loving them in the midst of whatever they said. Now you're analytically debriefing it and two hours later, you're a mess. You just get out around people who aren't thinking for others. And you didn't deal with that in your heart, in your bedroom. You didn't deal that in the shower and talking and communing and understanding who you are and why you're alive. That thing will slip up on you next thing you know. You're just another angry person that goes to church. See, the whole strategy of the enemy, this isn't condemnation. Don't get heavy on me. Look, the whole strategy of the devil is to kill the light. He doesn't care if you go to church. He cares if you shine. He could care less if you go to King's Fire. He could care less if you go wherever. He cares if you shine. He cares if you start walking in love. He cares if you start looking like the one he can't stop. (sighs) Yeah? He can't defeat mercy. He can't stop love. Wonder if you become those things. How you doing back there, man? Good to see you. Family reunion. Are you with me? The devil could care less. Honestly, I've come to believe this. I actually believe this. He'd care less if you do your daily devotions. Some people let their daily devotion take the place of knowing the Lord. So they qualify themselves by doing their devotions instead of knowing they're already qualified through the Son. So then they do their devotion to have intimacy and know Him more to look more like Him. Look, you can do your daily devotion and never commune with God. You can have a Christian t-shirt, ringtone, screensaver, and bumper sticker. (laughs) And be mad at somebody. And think all those things you do, Christian, mean you're Christian. Christianity is Christ-likeness. Christianity, little Christ-like one. It's who he is in you, and you're surrendered, you're yielded. I'm not talking perfection here. I'm talking purity of heart. I'm just talking a motive to wake up, to live in the Spirit, to have a healthy why behind my life. No matter what. No matter who does what, says what. That doesn't mean you don't believe for a better job. But until that job comes, or if it doesn't come, maintain the same countenance, walk in the same joy, pursue the same peace and love with one another. Don't let the answer of what you're believing for dictate what you express, or it's idolatry. All of a sudden, you're just like the devil when he's talking about Job. He's only the way he is because you blessed him. You hedged him in. You made him fat. No wonder he's the way he is. You take away the blessing, he'll, he's like anybody else out there. He'll curse you to your face like every other man. That's the devil talking to God. See why you can't be a Christian for you? Because you'll take life personal instead of him. You actually think you have a reason to be mad at God. You actually let your circumstances trouble your heart and you won't even be able to pray because you'll lose your view of him. You wonder where you failed and what door you opened and why is he letting the devil and and now you have all these questions instead of knowings and relationship. And all of a sudden your life is only as good as it's going. And all of a sudden... Life is speaking way louder than truth. And your focus is on what you're going through instead of who you've become in Him. And that's when it gets tight and tough. And that's when people lose their joy, their countenance, their productivity, and their expression. And that's the goal of hell itself is that your light would never really shine. That you would never really love one another. But that in some subtle way, you just come to God for what He can do for you instead of how He can make you more like Him. It's the goal of Christianity. 
Christ-likeness. It's transformation. It's a whole new way of thinking. Everybody in this room was trained by the wisdom of this world, whether you like it or not, knew it or not. By sheer instinct, you grew up a certain way. All our emotions looked a little the same. Some expressed a little more than others in some avenues more than others. So we type our personalities and we're this personality and this and we, everybody's labeling themselves with letters or numbers. Because <laughs> we're so desperate for identity. And then when you do that, then you get justified in however you express yourself because you're this type, you're this number, you're this personality. You're studying a fallen person. And you're locking yourself into an expression that doesn't even come from him. And then people spiritualize and say, well, God made me this way. No, no, no. Adam made you that way. I've heard this one a lot since I've been saved. Well, God gave us emotions, brother. He didn't give you the emotions you grew up with. Don't credit him for those crazy things. Come on. You know God didn't give you the emotions you grew up with. They haven't produced the righteousness of God. Those emotions have made you all over the map. So when you look at what they're producing, you can see the fingerprints on them. It just comes natural. It's the fall of man. Somebody does you wrong, you're ticked off, angry, insecure, hurt, taken back, whatever. You're telling me that that's God? God made you in his image and that's God? If that's God, he's a basket case. We've done broke his heart a thousand times over. Nobody can fix him. He's Humpty Dumpty. <laughs> he has fallen off the wall, man. <laughs> He's amazing. On your worst day ever, he wasn't taken back. He wasn't sitting there shocked and going, oh, and after all I did for them. And now they're going to, well, I don't even know how I could trust them from this day forward. Well, they just proved to me they don't love me. They just want my hand. They sure don't want my face. And then he start treating you different. You know why he doesn't do that? It's not because he's God. It's because he's love. We're so generic with him. Well, because he's God. No, it's because he's love. And he made man for his image. And he said the goal of our instruction, 1 Timothy 1.5, is love. And he said if you don't have love, you got nothing. He gets extreme with it, with giftings. He says you can have knowledge of sure. all mysteries. All knowledge, all mysteries. That's a spiritual icon to us. Somebody that has knowledge of all mysteries, that's the closest thing to Jesus we've seen. That's a pretty big deal right there. Everybody wants impartation from that dude. All knowledge, all mysteries. Faith to move every mountain. Every mountain that ever stood in front, just move aside. Faith, bam, move, bam, move. Come on. We're like, lay hands right there, buddy. Oh! He does it on purpose. He's extreme with his description. He didn't say some knowledge in some mountains. He said, you can have all knowledge. Of all mysteries, you can have faith to move every mountain. What he's saying is, you can have what looks like the ability of God and the power of God, but if you don't have the heart of God, you've got absolutely nothing. I don't think my goal is to prophesy. My goal is to become like him. And as I become like him, prophecy will be clear and sharp and productive. And I won't be self-conscious and self-centered, engaged in my spiritual awareness on how God's using me, but instead who he is in me. Very important. 
very important, especially when all of us were born into no identity. You understand all this, right? When man was born, he was born outside of what he's here for, so that means he's lost. So nobody in this room growing up has any clue who they really are. It's not until the light of the world comes. It's not until truth springs out of the earth. Man, don't be tricked into anything else. He's the Lord. Here's what impresses me so much. Here's what I, I, if I didn't have the revelations I had back in the beginning, this is what grabs me. This stuff grabbed me 23 years ago. I'm thinking, you came. I'm that childlike sitting on my bed. You came. I believe you came in my heart. I believe you came. And through the womb of a woman, you came as a man. That's a big deal. I think we've been lulled to sleep on some of this stuff. It's just an Easter story. Christmas. No, no. God became a man to redeem man back into what he intended from the beginning. He is, he is so impressed with that vision, not with man apart from him, but him in man. Amen. That he would come. And single-handedly take care of sin and get it out of the way and let it come on him and become who he is on that cross. He became sin. He must really want me righteous and holy and blameless and pure in his sight. He must really want me forgiven and empowered. He... Come on, we got to let first things matter first. You know, is, is, is the fact that he came something that has our attention? Or have we been religiously lulled to sleep by that knowledge for all these years? And then other things matter more than what matters most. And now it's how I'm doing, how work's going, how I'm being treated. What family member just did something off the wall? How your spouse just, oh my goodness, one of my kids. Ah, help me, Jesus. So are we reduced to that? Just trying to get by, just getting through, gospel survival kit. Man, don't confuse this intimate love as if you have some special access to God so he can make everything work for you. You have this special access to God because he never stopped seeing you for what you're here for and what he created you to be. And you got to grow up into that in all things. Christ in you, the hope of glory. It's the only hope of glory is the Christ in you. It's not your well-being. It's not your circumstances. It's not you getting a promotion. It's the Christ in you is the hope of glory. How well you love. How well you walk like him. How well you follow him. That's why he came. I think about this stuff, guys. Here I am saved for 23 years. You know, you, you, some of us think, man, can you, can you preach something deeper? This is deep. <laughs> he came. We got to sit on that long enough till it freaks us out. I mean, because then he's saying, watch what he's saying when he comes. I know who you are. You're worth it. I've known you from the beginning. You don't know who you are. You think you're this, that, or the other, or a product of this, or that. No, no, no. I know you from way back. And no matter where you've been, love hasn't failed. I haven't changed my mind about you. And when sin has abounded, grace has come greater. We ain't letting the devil win this thing. We are in this thing for keeps. And I'm going to pay a price, become what you were, so you can become what I am, a son from the beginning. And I'm going to put my life in you, my nature in you, and I'm going to restore you. Or, or... We've all sinned and fallen short and we got to pray this prayer so we can go to heaven when the trumpet blows. Isn't that amazing how that's the thrust? That we actually use, are you going to heaven? You're going to hell. And then people that have no revelation of his goodness and love, they're stumbled by the hell side of it. Well, why are we loving God throw people in hell? And now we got this... Long gnosis, just human knowledge debate. 
well, if God knew Adam was going to eat the tree, why'd he put the tree there in the first place? So God's the one responsible for all this chaos. I mean, he's the one. Ah! Ah! The only reason you can think that way is because Adam ate the tree. And you actually think you're right. That's a sure sign of the fall. <laughs> All these intellectual debates. Instead, just revealing the heart and motive of God. See, when you make it about heaven and hell, you actually miss the point. And you allow men to embrace something through faith, they say, claiming what they believe, but staying the same. And then we're just positionally changed. Seated in heavenly places with Christ Jesus, but I'm still on this hell hole called the earth and we got to endure through the suffer brother, but one day he's coming. Ah, that doesn't sound exciting. I honestly believe that's deception. Christ in you. Not just the person beside you. Christ in you. Not just the person that seems hungrier than you. Christ in you. Christ in you. Who do men say that I am? Well, some say, and others say, and you know some say, who do you say I am? See, you'll never rise above what you say. And what you really say, this isn't harsh, what you really say will be revealed through the way you live your life. The just shall live by faith, and you'll know them by their works. So the way you live your life reveals what you really believe. So if you really believe God came to transform you into his image, even if you're struggling with love, you're pursuing growing towards it. <laughs> even if you're struggling with forgiveness or unforgiveness, you're not justifying it, talking around it and staying the same. You're before him. You're talking. You're praying. Amen. You're seeking. Yeah? yeah? See, we're not talking about perfection. Talk about purity of heart. Talk about growing up into Him. Because, see, you can't let anything own the why behind your life and have possession of your heart. The why behind your life is your heart. Why you live. Why you wake up. Why you say that. Why you do that. Why you go there. You know, people go on a mission trip. Sounds so good in Christian. You can go on a mission trip for wrong reasons. You can pursue being a pastor for wrong reasons. Why? Do you do what you do? Because if the wise not seeking first the kingdom of God and for his true glory, that's how you can have knowledge of all mysteries and don't have love and miss the boat. You can give all your goods to the poor. Well, the, the poor will have your goods. <laughs> and they'll be happy for a season till the goods are gone. But you'll have nothing if you didn't do it because of love. Well, why would I give my goods, all my goods to the poor if I didn't have love? Because you might do it for name for yourself. You might do it to feel good about yourself. You might do it for the simple, shallow accolade of somebody saying you're awesome and you need to believe that, so you got to hear that. I've seen people serve in church, find their identity through serving in the church, church not recognize it, and then say, you are awesome. We couldn't function without you. I don't know what this church would do without you. And now they're serving double time and going extra, extra, extra mile because they're finding an identity in what they do. Now, I'm not saying that that couldn't be through an absolute pure heart, but I've been involved in situations where it wasn't that. And then they're on very thin ice because they constantly need the affirmation. And if they go the extra, extra mile and don't get the extra affirmation, then they can't find themselves. It's just a simple barometer. If you're finding identity through what you're doing, it's backwards. You find identity through who you've become. 
and how he sees you through his son. Period. If you find identity through your gifting, your calling, it's very dangerous. You find identity through what he accomplished, who, who he is in you. That's what will guard and protect your heart all the days of your life. You find your identity in him. He says you're holy, blameless, and above reproach in his sight. Guess what the easiest thing to do in the morning is then? Wake up and be that. Don't wake up and try to do that. Wake up and be that. And guess what that being will translate into? Expression. Isn't that awesome? The Bible says, if I present myself as a member unto righteousness, it will produce his fruit to holiness. All of a sudden, I'm expressing holiness without trying to be holy. All of a sudden, this communion is doing something in my heart and rekindling things and restoring things that were lost through sin and self-consciousness and human nature. And all of a sudden, this spirit-led life is something's awesome inside. Yeah? Just communing. And all of a sudden, there's things restored, like just a true sense of diligence and sincerity. <laughs> oh, my goodness. These things got lost through the fall of man. And every man on the earth was all about himself. <clears throat> Jesus said, you got to die to that. you got to deny that. That's the lie. So the biggest lie on the earth isn't all the stuff we focus on. Like, like I know it sounds like, watch, I don't have all the answers on this, but I, I know this is true. It's the, the biggest problem on the planet is in politics. It's not racial conflict. It's not terrorism. The biggest problem on the earth is that every day men wake up and live for themselves when they're made for his image. And a bigger tragedy is men go to church and do the same. And think church attendance is what makes the difference. But here's the deal. You could fill every church seat in every church on Sunday and the world's not going to change. But if the people become love, something has to change. Going to church will not change the world. Becoming more like him has to. So maybe the reason we go to church is to be her. Amen. <laughs> like wonder if we get so good at this. Because they're good. It doesn't mean they're wrong. But wonder if we get so good at this and fail to become her. And I wonder if we just learn how to do good church. To where people like coming. Sounds like a pastor dream and fulfillment. One of the biggest traps on the planet is just trying to do better church so people want to come. The reason you come is to be stirred up in love and good works, to be empowered to go. The reason you come is to be empowered to live within your sphere of influence and shine light and walk in the light as he's in the light. The reason we come is to marry to going. <laughs> so we come to be empowered to go. Yay. <laughs> but because people church shop, then pastors try to provide a product they're looking for. It's a trap. It's the biggest trap to any pastor is to turn inward and just try to do better church and call it success because you got a thousand people coming. But are you pursuing those thousand to walk in the light, to make peace through the week, that unforgiveness is unacceptable? Because it's outside his nature. I got some wisdom on this. I was asking the Lord why people struggle so much with forgiveness versus unforgiveness. Well, there's a couple reasons if you look at it just on the surface. Like, well, because they still are thinking for themselves. So they have lines people can cross, chips that can be knocked over. So they have unspoken expectations, which means they're getting failed. Are you following me? Yeah. 
But even in that, I'm saying, okay, but even in that, why is unforgiveness, like people will say this, who's ever heard somebody say this, well, you need to back off and just give me some time. Sometimes it just takes some time. And they're talking about forgiving. Or they say, well, stop, back off. I'm trying to forgive. If you're trying to forgive, you're in unforgiveness. <laughs> What's that even mean, I'm trying to forgive? It's not a, uh, okay, there it is. <laughs> Bam. Nailed it. <laughs> What does that even mean? I'm trying to forgive. It's a perspective. It's a perception. It's a position of heart. Forgiveness isn't a feeling and it's not a... Got it. <laughs> See, we're, we're, we deceive ourselves. We're buying time. We don't have when we... Well, I'm trying to forgive, brother. That, that, that's religious. That means you're in unforgiveness. So I'm like, Lord, why is, it, why is it like that? Why do I hear that from people? Here's what I, I, I saw in my heart when I was inquiring the Lord. It's a while back. People that struggle with unforgiveness have never accepted true and total forgiveness and have stood clean before the Lord as if they've never sinned and been overwhelmed by His goodness. A lot of people say, forgive me, Lord, and still live in the memory, stain, and tainted identity of what they've done and where they've been. And they haven't gone clean and free and never look back. But if you'll ever just be forgiven and stand boldly before God, not presumptuously, boldly, confidently, because of what Jesus did. The design of that is to overwhelm you with the goodness of God in such a way that it changes your eyes and all you can see men for is what they're called to be, not where they've been. What they're created to be, not what they've done. And instead of getting mad at them, mercy rises up because you know if they knew who they were, they would not be living that way. And instead of crying because of them, you begin to cry for them because mercy triumphs over judgment. Are you with me? So the just have to live by faith. We have to realize what he did on the cross. And even though we all sinned and fallen short of the glory, even though some of, us, some of us say, we say, yeah, but mine's different, brother. I knew better. And still went and did it. Well, you say you knew better, but now you really know better. <laughs> Peter said, I'll die for you. I think he was really serious. He found out a little more in the moment. Took that sword and started doing some cutting. I think he was really serious. When he said, I'll die for you. I think everybody at the table was serious when they said they'd die for him. Because they all whispered among themselves and said, we'll all die for him. He said he's going to be struck and they're going to scatter. And when he was done talking, they said, well, I ain't scattering. Jesus said they were going to scatter. Well, I'm scattering. I think they were serious. Who's ever heard somebody say, well, you don't understand. My sin was willful because I knew better and did it anyway. So they put themselves in a different category and forbid themselves remission of sin. When they actually see more now than they've ever seen. Who ever thought you knew something, found out you didn't really know it, and then you knew it? But before you were willing to say, I know it. And then time go by, and now you know it. See? So I've just seen people come up with about every little line that keeps themselves from this goodness that wants to wash over every one of us. Because honestly, it's not your willpower that causes you to change. It's not just your discipline that causes you to change. It's not just seeing the grossness of your sin that causes you to change. 
It's his goodness that leads you to change. That's why there's so much language out there. Christians against each other. Well, it ain't just about his love and goodness. It's judgment too. God's a judging God. And will you show me one scripture where his judgment leads me to change? Mercy triumphs over judgment. John 12, I did not come to judge you, but that you might be saved. You'll have my word. Remember the sword in the mouth when he comes? You'll have my word that will judge you in that day. Ain't that amazing? He, he says, I didn't come to judge you, but that you'd be saved. And then we think, we got to say, well, it ain't all about love, brother. <laughs> the greatest of these is love. If he loved us this way, we ought to love one another. If you don't have love, you got nothing. It probably ought to start there. <laughs> <laughs> In some strange way, when people uphold the judgment of God, it gives their hearts permission to remain that way as well. When you see him for, your, for his love and his mercy and his forgiveness, your heart responds in those things. Be careful, it's a trap out there. Are you with me? So if I see my life the way he sees me, truly the way he sees me, it's designed to look through my eyes and see you that way. So now I'm not just being loved by God, I'm being restored back to loving like God. It's what he paid for. It's the goal of our instruction. He didn't pay just for you to get your name in a book called Life and Go to Heaven someday. That, that's, not the, that's not the fulfillment of the cross. That's not paid in full. Paid in full is your transformed life. Old things passed away. Behold, all things become new, not conformed, transformed by thinking like you've never thought before. That's paid in full. So the deposit of the blood of Jesus into the earth brings dividends back to the Father. It's called the glory of His inheritance, not yours. His. Think about it. It's Ephesians 1. The glory of His inheritance in the saints. The glory of what He inherits through the deposit of one son. <laughs> Each seed after its own kind. Did you get it? We turn it into a beneficial prayer that blesses me because of that self-centered tendency. And he meant it to be transformation and change from the beginning. The glory of his inheritance, the exceeding greatness of his power, the hope of his calling. Not your calling, his calling. I can show you your calling in First Peter 2. It's to suffer when you're treated bad for doing good and take it patiently. To this you were called. There's your calling. <laughs> your calling. <laughs> is to suffer for doing good and take it patiently because you have him as your example to follow. It's right there. It's in First Peter. It says, what credit is it if you're beaten for your faults and you take it patiently? But when you do good, when you do good and you suffer for it, when somebody flips your good and calls it bad, and you take it patiently, and you don't let that phase you, 
It's commendable before God. Why? Because to this you were called. Why? You're in a perverse generation. You're living in a world that's after its own rights. Now you're a pushover, passive, doormat, enabler. Come on. Was Jesus any of those things? (laughs) Was he a doormat? People say, well, I ain't letting nobody make me a doormat. Well, then God's the doormat. Because he just loved you and loved you and you just didn't wake up and do everything you knew that was in your heart. But he just loved you and loved you and you just didn't even follow your conviction. But he just loved you and loved you. I guess he's a doormat. I don't think so. I think he's love. I don't think he's a pushover. I don't think he's an enabler. I think that sooner or later his goodness is going to get to us. We're going to find change in his goodness. <laughs> and then we'll be inclined to become what's so good. Right, right. So I'm going to try to wrap this up in this. You can't walk this thing out like we're preaching it tonight. Unless you let it wash over you and you become this thing first. You got to see he loves you this way. No matter where you've been, no matter how many times you repeated that thing, you got to say, whoa, you have not changed your mind about me. That's designed to empower you to not repeat that thing. You know where almost every addictive cycle comes from in behavior? People having a low esteem, not seeing themselves for what they're worth. Actually having derogatory beliefs, low-level, low-value beliefs about themselves personally. That's where almost every addictive cycle comes from. People not seeing who they really are in him. So then you don't have a good view of yourself even because of the thing. And then when you repeat the thing, it affirms what you believe about yourself. So now the tree's bad in your eyes, so the fruit has no hope. And then we say, well, it's amazing he loves us. Because people are people. (laughs) Yeah, it got a little growl out of me, didn't it? I just felt that. It just came up. (laughs) It's such a lie. And then people cry themselves to sleep or doll themselves and shut themselves down so they don't have to cry themselves to sleep. But the only reason you do that is because you actually do care inside. You're just being misguided. You couldn't even feel bad about anything if you weren't alive inside. So feeling bad can't be the answer. Feeling bad ought to at least point to something good and say, man, there's more than hope for me. I actually care. Come on, we take some of this stuff too lightly. I know people that go to church and live in condemnation in secret. So their living heart is getting abused by lies. And the fact that you care is getting twisted and producing a wrong fruit called condemnation. But you couldn't even be condemned if you didn't care. If you were what you were tempted to believe about yourself, you wouldn't even care. If you're so lost. (laughs) I've heard people in counseling sessions tell me some pretty serious bad things about themselves because their life proved it to them, but they were broken inside over what they were calling the truth. And if you can just talk to them about their brokenness and show them what that is and how it's being misguided, it can bring total freedom to somebody. Just the fact that you care is exciting to me. Somebody will pull you in the secret and cry their eyes out and tell you the baddest thing they've done. And they've been coming to church for the last three years and i got to tell you the secret, I've been sitting on it and I just go. <laughs> Who's ever had somebody open up and tell you something and couldn't even hardly get it out? Oh, it makes me so excited that they're talking about it and that they're crying so hard. 
And almost always across the board, look at them and I say, man, I'm so excited to see how pure your hearts become from the gospel. That you're alive. And they say, pure. Pure. (laughs) Did you hear what I just said I did? (laughs) Oh, I heard what you did. And we'll talk about that in a minute. But (laughs) but I see who you are. And the trouble is, you think you are what you just told me. But you're so much more on the inside. And you're believing a lie, and the trees stay in the same in your eyes, so the fruit can't change. But in a minute here, if we can make the tree good, we got good fruit on your horizon. Without you doing anything different. Just believing different. That sure beats, well, you can't do that. You're a Christian. You're representing him. You need to shape up or ship out. You're either for him or against him. Gather to him or you scatter. So you can use the word from the wrong places and do serious damage. Create legalistic stuff. You could tell them all that. You did what? You can't. You're misrepresenting him. Now you're supposed to be going to work shining as a light. You can't. Oh, my goodness. Well, see, he said you're either for me or against me. Maybe something's wrong. I'd say something's wrong with your heart. We need to kneel and pray till you get this this thing straight. I'll baptize you 20 times. Whatever it takes. (laughs) That's sometimes what pastors try to get people to change. You got to teach them who they are in him. And you have to get them to see themselves through his eyes. Yeah? Yeah. (laughs) Jesus raises from the dead. All them guys that said they would die for him. (laughs) (laughs) He raises from the dead. He says to Mary, go tell my brethren. He didn't say, go tell those weak-willed, two face <laughs> backstab and act like they love me he said go tell my brethren it's a covenant term it's family you know what he's saying you go let them know I haven't changed my mind about them they're still to me who they were before they ran and even after they ran I'll see him in a minute. Then he goes to the Father, takes his blood into heaven and makes peace through his blood, shoots back to the earth. (laughs) He must think a lot of us. See, that's what I get out of all this. Not some mysterious story that he wants us in heaven forever and ever and ever, whatever that means. I've heard, I've heard every conversation about, well, what's heaven going to be like? Well, what are we going to do there for, like, ever? <laughs> like, are we just going to sit by a throne forever and just... <laughs> like, two million years from now? Holy! <laughs> and then preachers say, well, he's so holy, you won't even know it was two million years. But yes, yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> and we're trying to relate to heaven. <laughs> Be honest with me. You've heard all this. Some of us have thought all this stuff. (laughs) You should teach people who they are. You teach people who they are now that he came. He came into that room, his disciples. It's in John 20. It's amazing. It's, it's, it's one of my favorite. When I think it's my favorite, a whole bunch more scripture bombs bards me. Because I just love the word of God. But I don't really have a favorite scripture. But that's in the top 100. <laughs> it's definitely in the top 100. Well, 200. <laughs> it's up there. It's ranking up there. Whew. Oh, man, the word's good, huh? See, now the word's just racing through me. (laughs) He says, go tell my brethren, I'm going to my father and your father, to my God and your God. What's he doing? I still see you as one. Nothing's changed. We've been one from the beginning. You just haven't known it. 
You just don't know who you are. Forgive them, Father. They know not what they do. That sure beats, what a bunch of idiots! <laughs> I heal their sick, multiply their food, I raise their dead! And they want to release Barabbas who's out there killing people? This is a confused generation! And if they didn't change by now, it ain't likely they're gonna! I'm not sure what I'm doing up here! <laughs> Not even sure if I like them anymore. You say, well, he couldn't talk like that because he's Jesus. He couldn't talk like that because he's love. He couldn't talk like that because he's love. He couldn't talk like that because of what he sees. Forgive him, Father. They have no clue what they're doing, man. They've been deceived. They've been born into Adam. They have no identity. They're sheep without a shepherd, but I'm here. If I be lifted up, I'm going to draw all men unto me. I'm going to open a door to salvation to all men. I'm going to come and sit at your right hand and put my blood, just like we talked before the foundation of the world. This thing is just about a wrap. I am pumped. Hey, I'm coming. I'm going to commit my spirit. <laughs> yeah? <laughs> it's all there, man. Then he raises from the dead. Mary's there. Go tell my brethren. Go unto my father, your father. You look up the word father there. You know what it means? To come forth from. I'm going to the one I came forth from, and I'm going to the one you came forth from. That makes us one. That makes us brothers. That's what the word father means, to come forth from. The word God means source of life. I came forth from the source of life. Now, how many people grow up and are sure their life's an accident? Or sure their life doesn't matter because life says so? How many people get tricked into suicide for whatever reason? Vengeance, get even, discouragement, despair, hurt, pain. Life's not worth living. And then they do the ultimate act of deception a human being can do is take their own life when it was never theirs. You see how tricky it is? Well, it's my life. I'll do with it what I want. It never was your life, friend. You're not taking your life. You're taking his life in you. Suicide is his life in you. You're taking his life. You're taking purpose, potential, legacy into your own hands because it's your life. Never was your life. Leave me alone. I'll have an abortion if I want. It's my life. I'll cut if I want. It's my life. I'll do drugs if I want. It's my life. Get off my back. I'll do with my life what I want to. Who's ever heard those phrases your whole life? See? It never was your life from the beginning. Let us make man in our... The image got lost through sin, and sin's running wild apart from him. He comes and takes sin upon himself, the lamb slain, to take away the sin of the world to reestablish truth and raise up sons and daughters. We turn it into a beneficial prayer that blesses me and takes me to heaven someday instead of heaven in me now and his ways and my ways becoming one. Right. So he says, he, comes, he tells Mary, and then he goes to the Father. And the same day in the evening, John 20, it's right there. It's same day in the evening. You can look in your Bible if you want. Same day in the evening, he shoots back to the earth. He comes into the room. There's no, they're shut up there. The doors are locked. They're in fear. The Jews, they're, they're in a fear fest. Like they're not interceding and praying. They're not shakarabaka. Right? <laughs> They're like, I'm so afraid. Like what happened to him is going to happen to us. We'd have been doing the same thing. I'm not busting on him. We'd have been doing the same thing. Don't think you'd have been doing something else. If I was there, I'd have been praying. Yeah. Save me. <laughs> he walks in a room and what's he say to him? Peace to you. Peace to you. Why does he say peace? Because he just made peace through his blood. They've done nothing right. 
Everything they said they wouldn't do, they did do, and everything he said to do, they didn't do. <laughs> and he comes and says, peace to you. Why? Because he made peace through his blood. And then he says this. Well, first he says this. Here, check, check me out. It's me, guys, because they were probably like we would have been. <laughs> this can't be you. I mean, they're praying for Peter to get released from prison. And when he knocks on the door, they say, surely it's his ghost or his angel. <laughs> Some translations different. Yeah? They're, they're praying for him to get released from prison. He's knocking on the door. They're saying, well, it can't be Peter. <laughs> He's in prison. Weren't you praying for him to get out? He's at the door. <laughs> Must be his angel. <laughs> <That's good. laughs> you can get religious, you know. You can pray stuff because of need and not believe a thing. Yes. You can find your most spiritual moment in the fact that you prayed instead of believed. You can get driven by the problem your whole life and call it prayer. He walks in the room. Peace to you. Shows him his hands, his side, and it says they were glad when they saw it was the Lord. And the very next thing of his mouth was peace to you again. But it's a different peace. The first peace, I made peace through my blood. Peace to you. You're my brethren. The second piece is, come on, I know how you're feeling right now. What do you think they thought as soon as they saw it was the Lord? <laughs> as soon as they realized it's the Lord, what's the first thing that tries to hammer them? They're picturing themselves running. Could you imagine what was going through Peter? He just... <laughs> be real he's standing there you cursed and said I never knew him three times but when you were with him you said I'll never deny you Lord but he did and now he's standing there this is his first since denying him so the second piece is him saying, look, I understand. I already told you. I know I'm here. Love you, boys. Amen. Peace. He's comforting him. He's telling him to not be condemned. To not stand there and let what they did wrong ravage their emotions and their mind. And ultimately their identity. He's separating them from that. And then he says to him, after the second piece, What's Genesis 1, 26 say? Let us make man in our image, in our own likeness, and let's give him dominion over the earth. Would you agree that's what it says? It, it describes what dominion, the birds and fish and every creeping thing. But once you say that Genesis 1, 26, let us make man in our image, in our own likeness, and give him dominion on the earth. You good with that? What's verse 27 say? So God created man in his own image, in his own likeness, both male and... You ought to love that, ladies. You have the same creative value as the man. Your value is his image. It's not serve the man. It's his image from the beginning. Woohoo! Yeah? So Genesis 1, Jesus is the Redeemer. He brings things back. Redeem means brought back to original value. So Jesus is the Redeemer. So John 20, Genesis 1, let us make man in our image, right? Verse 27, so God made man. How do he make man? John, Genesis 2 describes it, right? And man became so he did that in Genesis 1. Genesis 2 describes it. Details. Now we're in John 20 through the blood. Blood on the mercy seat. Peace to you. Oh man, it's you. Bummer. Peace to you. As the Father sent me. He's the Redeemer. He's modeling us life. He's showing us what life looks like in the Father. Empowered by Holy Spirit. Let us make man in our 
image, John 20, as the Father sent me, so I send you. You get the connection? And then he goes, what? Did he have to breathe on them for them to be filled with Holy Spirit? He holds all things together by the word of his power. He could say, be filled, and they're filled. He breathes on them to let us know, hey, guys, my blood brought you back to the beginning, to day one, where man was made for God's image, and as the Father sent me, now I'm sending you because we're one. Christ in you, the hope of glory, firstborn among predestined to be conformed to his image, beholding his in a mirror, the glory of the Lord being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, even by the spirit of the Lord. See, it all makes sense now. <sighs> Receive Holy Spirit. What did he do? He took him right back to Genesis 1. Because everything in that breath got lost through sin and it's the day you die, Adam. Boom. It was all lost. It's all brought back through the Redeemer. As the Father sent me, so I send you. For God so... See, here's what we do. As the Father sent me, so I send you. We think miracles, power, thunder, lightning all the time. We say, your will be done on earth as it is in... And we say, okay, and I'm not saying it's wrong, but it's our focus. Okay, no cancer in heaven no cancer on the earth and it gives us faith to come against cancer because of that prayer no animosity in heaven no pride no jealousy no insecurity no anger no frustration no discouragement no complaining no self-centeredness no self-focus no disheartenedness Isn't it amazing your will be done on earth as in heaven is always about the power of God in our theological breakdown instead of the heart of God, which is where all the power of God flows from. Right. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. There ain't no selfishness in heaven. Who is wise and understanding among you? James 3.13. Let them prove that they're wise by the good conduct of their life, that their works are done in the meekness of wisdom. But if you have bitter envy or self-seeking in your heart, don't boast and lie against the truth, for this wisdom never came from above. It's earthly, sensual, and demonic. For where there's envy and self-seeking, every evil thing is present. But the wisdom that's from above is first pure, it's gentle, it's peaceable, it's willing to yield, it's bearing the fruits of righteousness in those who make peace. Wow. Two different wisdoms there listed. One, the way that seemeth right to a man. Well, they should have never did that to me. Well, don't tell me that didn't hurt, wouldn't hurt you. Well, they should have known better. Well, how can I ever trust again? Well, that's why I put my guard up. That's the first wisdom. <laughs> oh, my goodness, you guys okay? <laughs> Haven't we all been taught to think and talk that way? And when we think and talk that way, don't we find people that agree with us? Oh, yeah. And they're our support system? Let me just share this one little thought because we're always looking to minister to each other. But if you would put yourself in the shoes of the person talking to you and you would be hurt like they're hurt, you can't help them. You'll just have sympathy for them. And you might even pray for them, but Holy Spirit's not there like you're thinking. He's not here to make you feel better. He's here to make you like him. Because if he can make you like him, that's where the pain goes away. 
You say, well, I just won't even make the pain go away. If he can change the way you see, he'll change the way you be. So he says, as the Father sent me, so I send you. That's Genesis 126. Through his blood, that's 27. Making man in his, because he says, if you forgive the sins, here's what he's doing. He's taking the, the Ray family here and he's saying, here's the baton of the New Covenant, New Testament church. I'm going to give it to both of you. They take that baton. He says, look, if you love them like I've loved you, then they'll know my love and the way to forgiveness. But if you don't forgive them like I've forgiven you, how will they be forgiven when you represent me and you're my body? You're my people. You're my heart. You're my wisdom. You're my expression. So if you forgive, they'll be forgiven. If you don't forgive, how are they going to be forgiven? Are you with me? Now you look at what's happened to the church over the generations. Legalism, darkness works, judgment, hair too long, too short, too much jewelry, no jewelry, hat, hair, boot, coverings, rope, eat, ah, eh. <laughs> and miss the heart of God through it all. And create animosity, animosity, and fight among ourselves instead of love the world around us with who He is. Don't you get caught up in religion. It doesn't change a thing. It actually makes men think they're all right when there's nothing in their life that looks like him. So they quote scripture from anger instead of compassion. Oh, I've met people that can quote the word twice as sharp as I ever have been able to. And they're mean. <laughs> <laughs> probably the goal is not quoting the word it's probably becoming it so until you see it in our lives I guess we're still growing in it and don't know it like we could are you with me it's just a good stirring up Keep your heart in the right place. This is why we're alive. This is why we'll go to bed tonight. And if we wake up tomorrow, this is why. You see what I'm saying? And you don't let anything matter more than what matters most. It, it's not some overbearing, overzealous, got to think about him every second. If people get that way. It's, it's a perspective that you grow into where you understand why you're alive and it's what matters most and it starts dictating your attitude, your responses, your expressions. It's because you spend time with him in that truth and you thank him for the gift called life, not the dread. You're not trying to get through life. Life's inside you. The only reason life's a grind to people or whatever they call it is because they wake up and live it outside of why they're here. So there's no grace in their going. Are you with me? So just a little reminder and just a little, yay, this is why he came. You all good with that? Now here's the deal. You got to live by faith. And you get to know God in your own life, in your own heart. It's not the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Who do you say that I am? Are you with me? And there's nothing I preached that you can't live apart from any other factor or person in your life right now if you live by faith. You can't say, but you don't know what I'm going through, brother. That's we I mean, been talking about that. Talking about what he went through to give you a different perspective. If I'm only doing as well as my wife is at the moment, then she's the Lord of my life. She's governing my life. She's deciding me. I need a higher wisdom. If I wake up to be loved by you, I'm only as good as you're loving me. And I'll remain insecure. And only as strong as the weakness around me. 
Are you with me? So every day you wake up, my prayer, my heart is that your conscious awareness would go this way and you would realize every day is a gift. I just turned 56 in December. I don't know where 56 years went. I can't even believe I'm saved 23 years. I was just thinking back at something that was in 2011 and it feels like it was about six months ago. And I was trying to think all the stuff in between. <laughs> Time's racing, kid out. I'm telling stories and they're 45 years ago. And I'm like... <laughs> <laughs> and then I'm looking at young people thinking, when I was their age and I was my age, that was a fossil. Like... <laughs> Like, like that was Ancient of Days right there. That's like, that man is old. Like I remember, I look at my granddaughter, she's 12, and I'm thinking when I was 12 and somebody was 56, that is a geezer. <laughs> Older than dirt. <laughs> From the beginning. Yeah. And I'm thinking, now I'm that fossil. <laughs> so I don't know where time's going, Gil. But it ain't stopping. And you can't get yesterday back. Can't let, it, can't let that eat you up. You guys say, you know what? I'm just going to make use of today. Yeah, but yesterday, you can't get it back. You can't rewrite the page. So why don't you just write a new, fresh page? Why don't you just start waking up in truth right now? And you start going after what's convicting your heart right now. Yeah? I'm making this specific. Remember his prayer? That you wouldn't just go, oh yeah, it was good. Well, what, what did he talk about? A lot. <laughs> but that you would actually leave here with a personal conviction. Sure. Yes. Right. That you would actually say, you know what? I need to start thinking about the why behind my life and waking up right. with a narrow, healthy why. I need to start going to my workplace with a different view and attitude and perspective. So it's never a grindstone or just a source of provision. But it's actually a mission field and I have a sphere of influence. There's people around me he paid for. There's people that he really loves. Even the ones that don't know him. Because he's known them from the beginning. <laughs> if you'll let a simple truth like that start getting in your heart, that man, if they knew who they really were, they wouldn't be acting the way they're acting. Whoo! that'll just free you up and start releasing some love if you just start realizing man if they really knew who they were they wouldn't even have that attitude and instead of being frustrated by their attitude you have compassion for them because you realize they don't understand forgive them father they don't know what they're doing because if they knew they wouldn't be sitting there oh my goodness let that make your heart be merciful not frustrated you say, well, that just gets on my nerves. No, I'm talking about getting new nerves. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Brand new. Y'all good? Yeah. I'll pray something over you, and then we're going to pray, okay? Hey, man. How'd you sneak up there? You just slipped on up there, man. <laughs> he's, just, he's like the Holy Ghost. He's like the wind. You don't even know. He's just... <laughs> what were you singing during worship when you're singing out of your heart? I was on my knees and there's people all around me. It sounded like you were singing that you made us holy. What were you singing? Is that what you were singing? What, what's the exact phrase you were saying? You made us holy? Do you make churches? Worship leader up there singing you made us holy? <laughs> Heretic and blasphemer? It's a sad reality. I, I thought that's what you were singing. I was like, King's Fire. I know this guy a little bit, so I'm thinking, you guys believe this. You got to understand he made you holy. If you don't start where he finished, you can't run well. He makes the tree good. Yeah. Not you trying harder. Right. He makes the tree good. Yeah. You got to let the tree be made good. If you wake up and acknowledge that you're holy in his sight, guess where your conviction will stay? Sure. In holiness. Guess what fruit it will begin to produce? holy responses in your life and all of a sudden you're living beyond where you could if you didn't have this revelation so it's his grace working in you he gets all the glory you're not a super Christian you're a believer 
then all glory goes to God. Because you are what you are by the grace of God. I love that. You sang it for a little while. And your whole team was singing it. You made us holy. Whew. Do you remember people would struggle with a phrase like that? But it's Bible. It says there was a time in your life and my life where we were alienated and enemies by the way our minds worked in wicked manner. That means just waking up and thinking for ourselves when we're made for his image and made to love. See, you gotta love that. Unless, no, you gotta, no, be, don't, yeah. Make sure you're nice to him. Look, watch. There is zero self-consciousness right there. Watch. Unless, and plus my preaching was so good, they just can't hold still. They gotta run. They gotta run. No, but watch this. Unless you become like a little child. Not a child, a little child. Because it's not long into little that you start getting aware of yourself. Start getting a little conscious of yourself. That's not fun. It's called a loss of innocence. And when he says, unless you become like a little child, he said, unless you get your innocent place restored, where you're ignorant to what is evil and excellent in what is good, Amen. you will not see the kingdom of heaven. Ain't that something? That's a prayer of ours. Just continue to restore my innocence as if I was never touched by anything outside of you. That I would wake up and just see myself the way you've always seen me and conduct myself the way you paid for. Yeah? yeah. Come on, it's a big deal. When you're sincere about what I'm saying, you, you take serious attitudes. Attitudes. They're not a dime a dozen. Are you kidding me? They're not even accepted. Attitudes that don't produce life. Little judgments, first impressions, whatever. Right? It's non-permissible. You don't even allow your heart to drift there. And if it would drift there, you'd shift over here quickly because you see where that is. You got to work out your own salvation. You got to walk that out. Amen? Yeah. So I'm going to pray this. Father, I thank you for grace on our lives. I thank you for empowering us to live this way, to walk this way, thank you. and to just simply shine. I'm praying that we would really, really, really be empowered through just the mouths of two or more. Just even this weekend, just saying things that a lot of these folks really do know in their knowledge, that it would be cemented in our hearts, that it would become our being, our expression, our real everyday living. I thank you there's no striving, there's no works. I thank you just the joy and the freedom of becoming. Keep it that clean all weekend. Keep it that simple and let our lives just continue to shine the beauty of who you are. Yes. And let people really, really get to know you simply because we've been privileged to know you at some level. Let our lives in you produce life in you, in others. Thank you. Lord. I ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. Let's do this real quick. Can I, can we have time or do yeah, I have to stop? Yeah. No, I have one little announcement about that. Okay, but what's too late? Are we too late? Am I, did I talk too much? Are we okay? I'm looking, I'm like, it got to be nine o'clock already. You gave me this thing early too. You guys, what'd you tell them? Two songs and get Dan up here or something? No, they sang three. I said twice the tempo, so we go quicker. Yeah. <laughs> the worship God. But you sang it, that you made us holy. See, I like that. That to me was, a, I was down on the ground and I, I just stood up and I thought, is he singing what it sounds like? It, it caught my attention. Hmm. Thank you. What would it look like in the morning if you wake up and get up in your bed and get up out of your bed and instead of just checking in with your flesh, your feelings, your work schedule, ooh, ugh, ooh, ah, uh, <laughs> help me Jesus, call in that prayer. What would it look like if you wake up in the morning and just sit up in your bed or just even just lay in there facing up and just put your hands out like this, you haven't even got out of bed yet. Mm -hmm. Father, I thank you this morning, you've made me holy through the blood of your son Jesus. You just washed me clean through everything you accomplished through your son. I thank you. I'm clean. I'm holy. I'm blameless. I'm pure. In your sight, God, thank you for robing me in righteousness, filling me with your spirit and filling me with your love. wonder if you personally, with nobody else there, will begin to accept these truths and say yes to them and actually believe them without any second thought. Yeah.
I've had a lot of people say a lot of things to me over the years because I've, I've been the same passionate way the whole time I've been saved. People that know me for 23 years, I just saw some people that knew me when I first got saved. They came to a church I was at down in Maryland and they walked in and surprised me. I was like, yay! And they just wept when they saw me. And what people that have known me my whole life tell me in private, they say, what I appreciate about you is the nonstop consistency of your life that what you see is what you get. And every time I see you, you're the same. You're not burdened down with a trial. You're not, well, my wife hasn't been doing good. Well, my kids are making some bad choices right now. You've just been on fire and in love with God even though those things were happening. <laughs> And I'm thinking, yeah, I don't know what else I'm supposed to be. <laughs> but there's a reason. The Lord showed me a long time ago the reason that I stay consistent without trying is because I believe I'm a son. And I'm not sin conscious. I believe he loves me. And that empowers me to live in a way that he paid for. And if I would realize I'm outside of that well I would see that quick wouldn't I and I would run to him but I think we're too busy deciding if that's even possible let alone what that looks like I think we've tricked ourselves into following ourselves while we say we're following him and we let our own sin driven human experience dictate what's possible so we say falsely humble things like, well, nobody's perfect, brother. Well, what are you saying? You don't have sin? Well, we're always sinning. We're sinning all the time. We're probably sinning right now. <laughs> Religion and the devil loves you to believe that stuff. We're not declaring we're holy to mask our sin. We're not declaring we're righteous to cover up our flaws. Righteousness produces its fruit Amen. to holiness. <sighs> the pure in heart shall, it must be possible to have a pure heart. Yay. <laughs> Come on. Okay. So here's what we're going to do. I usually don't have no music for this, but you're doing so good. Just do what you're doing. <laughs> Plus, I like you so much because he was singing, you made us holy. I'll just never forget that. I'm not going to forget that. I thought, wow, these guys are really preaching the gospel here. For your worship team to be singing, you made us holy. It's just a big deal to me. Because that should be in your bedroom every morning. That's what you ought to see when you look at yourself in the mirror. It's not presumptuous. It's not proud. You got to start where he finished. <laughs> if you live to try to be accepted, you'll feel like you're not. If you live because you're accepted, your actions will agree with what you believe. Yeah? If you just wake up and actually believe you're his, you'll live like you're his. You don't ever have to prove you're his. Your life proves it. So wake up and be his. Amen? Amen. Can, we, uh, can we do this quick? Uh, can we pray for the sick or anybody that wants prayer for healing? Could we do that? Y'all yeah. good? It's not too late, right? It's like we're not past the healing hour. <laughs> I just thought I'd check. I just... See what the room believes, you know. Maybe <laughs> we good? Oh, okay. I've been doing this for years when I travel. We pray for the sick and uh way, way, way back, way, way, way back I used to line people up and pray for everybody. In fact that's why I got invited to churches sometimes it was just because of the way I ministered. There's giftings in my life. I enjoy the giftings. Who enjoys gifting? Who? Like, I love sitting on an airplane. And I'm like, you're just like, you're just sniffing something out in the Lord. You're like. <laughs> 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 
and they'll have their little earbuds on. And you say something. What the? How? You? <laughs> it's just fun. <laughs> There's just no other way around it. It's just fun. <laughs> When I used to travel years ago, when I traveled, I was preaching actually in churches before I was a year old in the Lord. I was being invited to guest speak in several churches, and I wasn't even a year saved. The main reason was my gifting. So everybody wanted to partake of my gifting, benefit from my gifting, get a word through my gifting. So people would see me and they'd come up and say, just pray for me, whatever God tells you, just, just pray. <laughs> whatever he says, whatever he says. <laughs> There's a little ways into that, the Lord said, hey, what you're doing is great. And the fact that you've grown into some things and you're seeing expressions of who I am in your life and stuff. But how are you multiplying, training, equipping, empowering, like... You're just ministering. And I went, like, who are you equipping? And I said, I'm not even thinking about that. I'm just having a blast. I remember, and it, it just flips people out, and they'll make you, they make you a hero. They make you an icon. Like, like, it's gifting. No man has anything. Let's get this straight. Nobody has a thing unless God's given it. So there's nobody that's a real big deal. <laughs> But God, we somehow think you're extra spiritual if you have a certain gift. If you have a gift, you have a gift. It's without repentance. I remember services where I would line people up. And it would just freak people out. And, and I got in trouble doing it. I don't talk about it much. It, it, was, it was getting me in a wrong way. Because people made such a big deal out of gifting. And, and when I was first young and saved, and I was pretty early on this thing, I, I would line people up. I remember saying, don't tell me why you're here. I don't want anybody to even tell me why you're here. And I would teach on word of knowledge. And then I would just say, well, you're standing here, and the number one thing you're believing for right now is this. And they go, ah! It just freaks people out. They're like, wow. But they make you somebody. And I wasn't handling that well in the beginning. I don't know who would handle that well if you never get a real grip on that. If all you do is just minister out of your gift. Our goal isn't to minister out of our gift. It's train and equip and empower people to be more like Him for the work of the ministry. Are you with me? But I remember in that season doing that. And uh, it was touching my heart wrong. I used to think... If everybody wasn't stuck to the floor or the wall, <laughs> I did. I believed that if everybody wasn't stuck to the floor or the wall, God didn't come like he could. And it started getting weird with me because it started to be about me and manifestations and gifting. And I remember ministering wouldn't even leave the platform. And I would just point and shout and you, ma'am, in the stripes, stand up, fire! Ah! <laughs> and everybody's like, But it was getting weird. It was getting weird with me. It was all about manifestation. And there was a season where it was happening so profuse. But the people that were hurting after the smoke cleared were still hurt. There was folks that had cancer laying screaming on the floor, stuck to the floor, couldn't get up. Somebody carried them to their car, but they still got the cancer. I didn't think too deep on it. And but things got weird for a while. Your motive is important. You can open a door so big, anything can happen in a room. He paid for stuff. And it doesn't always have to be through a... Ah, ooh, pfft, ah. I've seen four-stage cancer disappear. And nobody even really prayed. Are you following me? And the person with the cancer didn't even shake or feel a goosebump. You say, well, I felt heat. Okay, great. So what, if you don't heal, feel heat, nothing's happening? We got to be careful with this stuff. 
I changed a lot of things over the years. I got in trouble. The way I ministered got me in trouble. I never said this publicly, ever. Probably got it recorded. I'll cause a little bit of stuff, probably. Oh, Lord, what am I even doing? I'm not sure everything that was happening through my life at that time was God. Because it became important to me. For me. I'm not sure everything was even God. And you all don't know me back then. Some people knew me back then. One night I went to a church. And this is when I changed. I walked in and I had my finest suit on. Not that I'm against wearing suits. I just thought you were supposed to, but I don't, I, I don't even know if I have a suit I would want to wear right now. I just have it. I don't have suits. I, this is me. I'm comfortable. I don't know what I'd do if somebody asked me to do a funeral. I have to probably go try to get a suit. I just don't do funerals, really. And I don't do weddings, so I'm pretty covered. <laughs> but I walked in this church, and I had my fine suit on. I had my little tie chain, and I felt like a preacher. And everybody's just stroking me, coming in. We are so amazed you came to our church. You are so anointed. The way God moves through you. Oh, my goodness, you ain't even been saved. Phew, the way you hear his voice. And I mean, I'm like, yeah, I'm anointed. Phew. It was getting weird with me. But I didn't see it. And on that night, it was such a holy atmosphere. People were laying out everywhere. Pastor and his wife were prostrate on the floor. I should have been with them. I'm standing there. Wow. Couldn't wait to minister. I thought, Lord, this is good, man. I'm praying to him all the time. I'm seeking him. I'm hungry. It's crazy how this stuff happens, how your heart motives can get shifted and how you can feel important and miss grace and humility. How you can feel like somebody and miss that you're nothing if it wasn't for him. Even this whole honor one another thing that's out there. We talk so much about honoring each other. Be careful with what we're trying to honor and find honor in. The Bible says, how can you believe you who honor one another? <laughs> you need honor from one another. Meaning you need it. How can you actually believe that'll get in the way? There's a healthy honor, but there's a thin line, and I think sometimes honor's even over-preached. I'm not even sure why I'm telling you this story. It'll make sense here at some point. Because I never told this story in public. Ever. In, ever. You guys are the first. They had a handheld mic on a wooden platform just like that. It's a handheld mic. I don't like handhelds. I'm going to use some other mic, but the handheld's there, and I'm not hooked up yet. The worship team, we lost the worship team that night. There was nobody available. There was one little girl. She was a skinny little thing. She, she was over by the keys, and she was down below the keyboard. She had her hand up like this, but she looked like she was wilted. And somehow she was hitting them high keys. It just sounded like rain or something. But she's just ding, ding. And everything she touched was like, oh. People were just, Jesus was in the room. It was real. I just can't wait to minister. Didn't realize how I was about to get fathered. So I'm looking and I'm like, Lord, what do you want to do? What do you want to do? What do you want to do? Who do you want to speak to? What do you want to do? And my eyes fixed on a lady. And the Lord gave me a word with time frames and details that if I was wrong, I would look pretty foolish. But if I'm right, here's the problem with a word like that. If you're right, then people go, whoa. Now, you're on fragile ground, because if you're being moved through like that, you better use that as a simple example to show people what's possible, that this grace is available, and have your highest goal to multiply that grace so other people start hearing like that. Not to build a ministry, 
or be gifted. There's no scripture that tells me where to point out anointed people, build a conference around them to minister to the church. It's to train, equip, and empower the church. Well, here's what God had to say about that night in my heart. My heart was slowly crossing into this place that wasn't good. And when I got that word, I was like, oh, that is so amazing. Because I had heard words and I knew it was a word from the Lord. Like, if I'm sitting beside you on a plane and have a word like that, I'm, I'm not going to fish around. I'm just going to say, hey, three weeks ago you were told. I'm going to say it like I heard it because I trust that it's right on. And they're going to go, what? Are you psychic? And our, our response is, well, kind of, but not really. I'll explain. But that happened, didn't it? Yeah. And then God moves. That night I took the mic I flipped it on and I was like, it was one of those atmospheres where like nobody wants to talk, but I couldn't wait. But I wasn't going to just bust in. You know, you learn how to minister, unfortunately. You learn how to, you know, you know God is in this place. Right now he's there. You just, you just know how to do it, right? And while he's moving and ministering, I, for you, ma'am, I got this word and I was going to get her up and fire up. That's what my plan was. I flipped on the mic, and I went, this happened to me. I've never told this story in public. I went, I had no human ability to speak. People say to me all the time, I don't even realize, like, they, like, like you don't think about humility in your life, but this is one thing I get from people. They say, you're so humble. You're this, this, and I'm like, I don't even know what you're talking about. I'm not, I'm not, I don't even think about humility other than I want to walk in humility, but I'm like, but I get this. When that stuff happens to you, it will produce humility without you trying. It'll put the true fear of the Lord in your life. So I got a word that is so ridiculous, accurate, detailed, and time frame. I flip on the mic and I go, and I have no human ability to speak. There's no way I can make sound. Now you let that happen to you. And maybe you'll understand me and some of the ways I come across to my passion. Because in that moment, you know he's real before it happens. But in that moment, he is really real. <laughs> and I'm holding that mic. And I went, and he said, see, Dan, you couldn't even talk if I didn't let you. <laughs> and I can, I can still hear the sound of the handheld bouncing off the wood because it fell right out of my hand. And then I collapsed like you shot me with the gun. And I curled up in a ball on the floor for probably three quarters of an hour and wailed and cried at the top of my lungs. Ripped with conviction and pride. <clears throat> so I got up from that place and confessed my sin to the whole church. Told them what happened to me. It's amazing. The word for the lady was dead on and I still gave it to her, but I gave it to her in fear and trembling and real soft and quiet. <laughs> I was almost afraid to give it to her. I said, it all started when I looked at you, ma'am. And what I heard in my heart was this and this. And she went, ah! I said, I know it's really detailed, but it's just God. And yeah, I, just, I said, come on, stand up. Come on up here. I said, I want to pray for you. And just God's just telling me that. And I'm doing the room. When I opened my eyes, she's laying way back there on the floor. <laughs> and I was like, oh, dear Jesus. So when I got home, the fear of the Lord's on me. I began to commune with him and cry. I cried a lot. You let God take your voice. And you're trying to speak and you can't make a sound. That's humbling. And I, I pulled way back. I pulled way back. And the Lord just let me just kind of respond that way. I pulled way back. I did some counseling. I taught a little bit at my church, but I pulled way back. I, I didn't even go travel anywhere for a while. 
It just, you let it happen to you. You can tell me I should have this or that, but you let, you, you let God take your voice. Right. Then one day I was sitting early in the morning reading my Bible and praying about some things in our community. And the Lord sat down right beside me. It was like he put his arm around me. And he said, hey, when I got your attention back there and I knew what he was saying, he said, I, I didn't tell you to turn off and I don't want you to be afraid. Just understand it's me. He began to father me, talk to me about multiplying, equipping. And I said, okay. And slowly I began to come out of that and kind of grow up into him in some ways he was directing me. So I started, we started praying for the sick all the time in services. But I get everybody involved. I can't tell you how many people have gotten empowered, how many people have been healed. How many emails I get and people say, man, that was the first time I ever really stepped out and prayed. And oh my goodness, it made it so simple. Da, 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 da. So that's what we're going to do tonight, okay? Can we do it? We won't take super long. I know I do everything long. I'm sorry. It's the gift of long. <laughs> I'm a teacher. I do teach. When you pray for the sick, there's two things you'll run into. Lots of different situations, but there's two things you'll run into. You'll run into people that if they were healed in that moment, they wouldn't necessarily know. They'd have no way to gauge that because it comes and goes. It's internal. It would need a test. You following me? There'd be no way to know. And then there's other people that would absolutely know because they have physical symptoms, impairment, weakness, grinding, pain, whatever. You guys know what I'm saying. You got two categories. Here's what you need to understand. You have to need to understand this. They're both the same. One's not easier than the other. They both require faith and they're both the same. Don't favor one over the other. Don't get intimidated by one or the other. Some people tell me, well, it's easier to pray for people if they wouldn't know if they were healed because you could just release faith because you don't have anything to check and you just believe. And I'm like, what? You're supposed to be sincere. You're not, it's not, a, you're, it's, it's, it's not an out. Whew, I'm glad they can't check their body. They might still be hurting if they could. That's a, no. It, they're both the same. It's the same faith. It's the same prayers. Here's what we need to know, and I teach this everywhere I go. Your prayer, your prayer never has and never will heal the sick. It's his finished work. It's what you believe about what he accomplished coupled with the love he has for people. That's where healing is. I want to keep it so simple here tonight. Okay? It's just real simple. I could, you could teach for days on this stuff. I think we've been overtaught on a lot of this stuff. And a lot of our teaching has come out of our experiences instead of his word. So be careful about that. Make sure that what you believe is because of Jesus' life, not what happened or didn't happen. What I believe comes from him in his life. My mother passed from sickness. That doesn't change his word. Your mother? Well, that doesn't give me much confidence. We're following Jesus, not my scenario. I'm growing. I'm learning. So are you. If you're finding truth through my experience, maybe we're looking in the wrong place. Because people say, well, Pastor Dan's mom died of sickness, and I know he was praying for her, and he's walking in righteousness, and he got a revelation, and he didn't see her healed. You can't tell me he didn't have a mustard seed. I mean, God mustn't want to heal people. That's what people do. I've seen it over and over. You can't go there. We're growing. We're learning. It's one of the most painful seasons, turmoil seasons in my life because of what I preach and what I believe. And, and I didn't know what I know now, so I had some wrong beliefs, but it was just emotional. It was my mom, and I go to a service and see people healed, and there was my mom. And one service, two people with the same disease she had, all their symptoms left right at the altar. I just left the church. I just didn't talk. I said, I got to go. I was crying. They were jumping around laughing and all excited and all their impairment left. I mean, it was dramatic. And I didn't let nobody touch me. I'm like, I'm in this thing right here. I'm in this river. 
I'm, well, I got a breakthrough today. I'm going to go pray for my mom. I drove all the way over her whole way across town to my mom, laid hands on her. Nothing changed. But then you live in that moment. You turn it into a point in time. All of a sudden, face a point in time. Now you're, now if it doesn't change, you didn't get nothing. Belief is just hit, miss, win, lose. He does heal. He doesn't heal. Ah! What he taught me through all this is faith is a position of your heart. You believe for people. If I'm walking down the street and I see somebody hurting and I can see they got something on their arm, embracing their arm, like to keep their arm in, I say, hey, what'd you do? Oh, I this, I that. Does it hurt? Oh, man, does it hurt. Listen, man, are you in a hurry? Well, yeah, I got to get it and I got this appointment. Listen, give me 10 seconds, okay? This will be awesome. Just 10 seconds. What? I just want to pray for you, man. Please don't say no. 10 seconds, man. Really? Oh, I don't know. If I, no, listen, man. Just 10 seconds. I want to believe God. If I had never seen this before, I'd probably be a fool to just stop you and talk like this. But he's a healer and he changes things. And I ain't praying just to see what might happen. I'm believing he'll come. That's how aggressive I get when I talk to somebody. So when I pray for them, what happens if they say, well, I appreciate you praying, but I got to get going. And you prayed about 15 seconds, not 10. So I got to roll. <laughs> I have one lady say, well, thanks for trying. <laughs> ah! Thanks for trying. See, it used to affect me. It used to, I would live by that moment. <clears throat> a lot of Christians, a lot of us won't pray for people because we're afraid nothing will happen. So then we don't pray, so we already have what we're afraid of. So I think we ought to just get over all that and get over us and go after it, right? So we're going to pray tonight for the sick. I'm going to get you guys involved with me. I'm going to do it as clean and quick as I can, but it'll be fun. It'll be effective. Jesus, will come. he's good. He heals people. He just heals people. He just does. And what he gets excited about is have people in need of healing that have a situation are humble enough to say, hey, this is in my life. This is a situation I've been encountering. I know it's not God as well. I just believe he has something for me called healing. See, a lot of people are so taught and overtaught. They're like, well, I don't want to stand up and pray because I don't want to claim it. I don't want. The Bible says, is any among you sick? Let him ask. You can ask without taking on the identity. You can ask without empowering it. All you're doing is saying, man, I got this situation in my body, and man, I just know it's not my lot in life. He is so good, so amazing. He changes things. He loves me. Just pray with me. I just believe he wants to heal. It's just simple. You see what I'm saying? So tonight, it pleases him and excites him. If you have a situation less than what you'd call wholeness, and you'd say, hey, I want somebody to believe with me, and I'll tell you what really excites him. If somebody would get out of their chair and say, I'll be that person that believes. It's one thing if I would line you all up and pray and flow in my gift and look, try to get some momentum, and I, and I know some folks would get healed, and, and that would be great for them, and I get all that. But I think we can have that same fruit if we all just step out in faith. I believe we can have that same result. That's what I'm fixed on. I've been believing that for a long time and, and seeing God do cool things when we pray like this. Are you with me?